Welcome back to Behind the Bastards, the podcast where we talk about real bleak shit. And uh, boy, howdy, uh, my guest today, Aiden Bonacci. Aiden, did I get it right this time? Yes, you did, Ben. Thanks for having me, question mark. Yeah. How are you? How are you enjoying learning about the Judge Rotenberg Center? I am not surprised, but I'm also very depressed. Yeah, well, it's about to get a lot worse, uh, uh, actually, uh, significantly worse, vastly worse. Um, Fun. How do you feel about electrocuting children? (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's the right response um can we stop with the electricity once please god yeah no 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 it's uh yeah we actually should start this episode by talking a bit more about the parents who have made matt israel's career possible it should be clear by everything i've said so far that i think they're wrong and in some cases profoundly abusive but people who are wrong can have compelling reasons for being wrong that are not easily dismissed Mm -hmm. George Nazareth, former head of the Rhode Island Human Rights Committee and the first person to take a serious deep look at the fucked up workings of BRI, probably put it best when he was asked by a reporter from the Boston Phoenix why so many parents would sign off on approval to have their children abused. Quote, desperate parents will sign anything. You become desperate about a lot of things. Some of the parents at BRI are now saying they want the program to continue. They think the state will send their children back home. Some parents would blow their brains out if the state sent their children back home. They've been through the mill. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's, they have their reasons, but at the same time, it's yes. like, just because it may seem like the right thing doesn't mean it is it's certainly not and I, i'm not trying to say i mean part of what i'm getting at here is that um a lot of these parents why they like the bri isn't that it's helping their kids it's that it's keeping their kids away mm-hmm. and and the judge Rodenberg center is taking kids from multiple states so they're taking the most severe kids and it's not right that a lot of parents are willing to accept this school because it keeps their kids away But that's the, that's, that's where they are. And there, it it is not a thing of like, they're not, it's not that I don't think they see themselves as being cruel. I think they're unthinkably desperate in a lot of cases and they're not, there aren't a lot of options for them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that doesn't defend this. Cause again, I'm, we're spending 10,000 words and two hours talking about how bad this place is. Oh yeah. It's inexcusable, but yeah, it's, but it's not unexcusable. Yeah, it's not okay. It's not acceptable, but it is the result of of a desperation more supreme than I think most people can grasp. Mm-hmm. Um, especially, and this becomes less the case because now I think the parents who are defending it have options. It's fucking nineteen eighty five. Like autism as a diagnosis is five years old. What options do you have? Not that this was the right one, but there's just not a lot of good ones. Yeah, for there's parents. yeah, not. Or even any of them besides yeah. this one. Yeah. And it's, you know, even, even if there were in, in, you know, there are in some cases other options for parents. I, mean, I, I don't want to also make it like, look like it was more, but also the amount of education the parents might have about what's available is minimal. Like it's just, oh yeah, you, you have to, and again, really want to emphasize that we're not, we're not trying to whitewash either the parents or what's happening at this facility, but like, oh, absolutely. It's a desperate situation. Um, and that's that that's part of what I think condemns Matt Israel more because he is taking advantage of this desperate situation to test his weird you like human behavioral modification theories. He's taking advantage of of this horrible, horrible situation. Yeah, like we mentioned in the last part, he sees them more as features than yes. as actual children. This yes. is just something to show off. Yeah, something to show off how good he is at plugging in new stimuli to alter their behavior. And it doesn't matter to him, I think, that this that he's just torturing these kids into stopping behavior. He's not changing anything. He's not he's not helping them. He's temporarily stopping them from doing something via violence. I don't think he cares because the behavior has stopped and he has no problem continuing the violence forever. In fact, he gets he gets paid if he gets to continue the violence forever. Yeah. Um it's real bleak. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so George Nazareth, the guy who gave that quote about some parents would blow their brains out if they sent their children back home. They've been through hell. Nazareth is number one. He's the guy who carries out the first big investigation of BRI and condemns it unequivocally. 
He's also the parent himself of a mentally disabled daughter. I don't know how to be more specific about her condition than that, because in the 1985 article where I found this, she's just referred to as retarded. The fact that a thoughtful, Mm -hmm. compassionate, and very ethical man like George Nazareth would use that term for his own daughter is a sign of how primitive the things were in that period in terms of the science. Um, Because this was not considered an, an offensive term. There are advocacy agencies called like the Organization for Retarded Persons and whatnot mm-hmm. um, that use that word. And I, I bring this up because the primitiveness of the terminology in use suggests how primitive the other methods of treatment were as well. Mm-hmm. While the Judge Rotenberg Center was marked out by experts at the time for its brutality, the gold standard of care during that period also involved a lot of unnecessary force and medication, which is a kind of force. Oh, when yeah. these parents say they're worried their kids would get stuck in an institution and drugged to unconsciousness, that is not a lie or an unreasonable fear. A lot of these people are in impossible situations. Matt Israel promised he could help their kids. And in many cases, he at least seems to have delivered. And one of the things that he does that makes this such a, um, that makes him so good at at getting these people to believe in him is these are beautiful facilities. These are not dank and frightening looking places. They're not run down. They're colorful. They're filled with toys and statues of, of creatures. And like they're, he makes them look extremely friendly and comfortable. So if you're a parent taking Mm -hmm. your kid and this place looks like a wonderful place for your kid to live and, 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 and be treated. And he can say like, Hey, your kid's been biting or, or tearing open his skin. And that stops after a couple of weeks. And maybe you don't notice why it's stopping and what he's doing to stop it, you know? Um, It's also a lot of the parents who defend him aren't entirely aware of what's going on at the school. And you can blame them to some degree for not availing themselves of the information that's out because there are reports on this place, but Mm -hmm. that is the situation. Um, So uh, by 1985, Matt Israel School, which is still called the Behavioral Research Institute at this point, received $87,000 per student per year. And a lot of that wound up in Israel's pocket. His compensation topped out, I think, around $2,000 at $300,000 dollars a year um so he's making a a very comfortable income Uh, but at the same time he is putting most of the money into this facility these are expensive facilities to run there are in many cases Mm -hmm. multiple full-time employees per student um that Boston Phoenix article, which was a major source for episode one, was written during the massive series of legal battles between the state of Massachusetts and BRI. Thanks to Judge Rotenberg, those struggles eventually went Israel's way. But at the time the article was written, he did not know that. And the piece ends on this ominous line. Quote, if Massachusetts shut down BRI, Israel says, he may open group homes in Rhode Island. Israel thinks the current crackdown may lead to greater understanding of his philosophy and allow him a greater array of behavioral modification tools. I've never used electric shock, he says in his calm, soft voice. I wouldn't rule it out, particularly if we were deprived of other procedures. It's more effective and you wouldn't bruise or cut the skin. Oh, fuck off. (laughs) Yeah, that's real bad. That's real scary. And I, I kind of flipped out a little when I read that in this 1985 article. Um, and I, I, I should note here, the only reason I have access to that article, because that's a 36-year-old article, yeah. it was originally published in a physical newspaper. Mm-hmm. I was able to read it because several copies have been archived by different disability justice advocates. Autistic civil rights advocates have a very particular interest in documenting Matt Israel's early career and his crimes. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, they're doing this because they think he's basically a war criminal, um, which, by the way, the U.N. agrees with. Um, and they're they're trying to make sure like I, I'm, I'm assuming a, a an autistic civil rights advocate who was like read came across an old copy of that, read that end piece where he starts talking about how he's looking into electric shock and was like, well, this needs to be preserved. Like yeah. at some point there's going to be a reconciliation commission or whatever, and we need to document this shit. When we left off in the late 1980s, BRI was still BRI, but Judge Rotenberg had just saved it. Or to be more accurate, the judge had saved its ability to use physical punishments on students. In 1990, another student, Linda Cornelison, died. Yeah, it's it's a weird C-O-R-N-E-L-I-S-O-N. I've never seen that last name before, but uh, I think Linda Cornelison. Um, in 1990, she died. Uh-huh. And she was a, a nonverbal student at the facility, which means she's, she's not really able to use language to communicate. And one uh-huh. day she started grabbing her stomach while she was on the bus to school. And a lot of these kids, they'll go to a school and then they'll go home to a residential facility that BRI runs. When she arrived at the at the at at her school, a nurse decided that 
she was just acting to try to like get attention or something and sent her back to class. After school, she was sent back to a BRI run residential home where she lived. Staff were angry at her bad behavior. They believed this nurse basically like, oh, she's she's playing around by pretending to have stomach pain. So they oh, gave boy. her 13 spatula spankings, 29 finger pinches, 14 muscle squeezes and forced her to inhale ammonia five times. She died in the hospital the next day. Um, uh, yeah. And again, her, her the cause of death was gastric perforation, which I don't think was caused by any of the aversives that were done at the school. But the fact that she was not taken to the hospital earlier, her pain was not treated seriously. Mm-hmm. That's certainly their fault. And also super negligible. Yeah, very, very bad. Very, like, I, I would feel comfortable saying they killed her, even though maybe they didn't cause the thing that killed I would her. say the ammonia yeah. was just like, my <laughs> didn't help. <laughs> didn't help. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Linda's mom insists she never, her daughter never had gastrointestinal problems before. Um, it's maybe, it might even be possible that like the stress from all the aversives had helped cause the gastrointestinal. I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to, I'm not going to speculate further mm-hmm. other than to say that by not taking this problem seriously when she started to complain. And this is again, part of like the, the, the bigotry, I guess you would say, I think, yeah, mm-hmm. bigotry is a fair thing to say because yeah. she's not verbal. They assume she's not capable of expressing a serious concern about a a health problem right Mm -hmm. she has to be just like fooling around trying to trick you um and um that's that is a kind of bigotry and it led to it's a bigotry that led to this girl's death um so um the state found after the the autopsy and whatnot that Mm -hmm. that while bri had not caused her death uh the it had quote violated the most basic codes and standards of decency and how it treated her um and mm-hmm. while so while there were no charges on Matt Israel or the facility as a result of Linda's death it did have an impact on him he decided that there were too many different kinds of physical punishment at his school and the nature and impact of those punishments varied too much from teacher to teacher in other words he was concerned that one employee's pinch could be a mild pinch and another could cause a bleeding wound he mm-hmm. wanted more uniform physical aversion and he decided that electric shocks were the best way to do this. Uh, the machine he picked was called the Self-Injurious Behavior Inhibiting System. It was made of an electrode and a radio transmitter, which were attached to the arm or leg via Velcro. The shock was described as like being like struck by a rubber band. You know, somebody pulls back a rubber band, like not serious, not a real, yeah. like a very mild shock. And it lasted about a fifth of a second. One 1990 paper on the SIBS, SIBIS system, said the shock caused quote almost complete elimination of self-harming behavior we can debate whether or not this kind of treatment is ever ethical but it Mm -hmm. is important to note and 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 whether it's ethical is again a separate question from whether or not it works we'll talk about that a bit later we can debate that um it is important to note here that this machine was not designed as a punishment they were not trying to shock kids to punish them. They were trying to interrupt them when they were harming themselves, right? Mm-hmm. The people who made this machine felt that such extreme measures were justified if the mild shock would stop a kid from biting through their hand or bashing their head against a wall. And again, I am not saying this is the right move. And, and in fact, the evidence suggests that this doesn't really work all that well. Yeah. I get why. I don't think these scientists who say, well, let's try this. We're, we're being monsters. Even though we can say this was a bad road to go down and did not yeah. help, you're, they are not trying to punish kids. They are trying to stop kids from hurting themselves. And again, it doesn't work, but it's not – the start road for this technology is not monstrous. Yeah, it's not fully malicious. It's just mm-hmm. – you, not you can say unethical, you can say unwise, unwise. you can say ineffective. Yeah. They're, not, they're not doing what Mad Israel comes to do. They're not trying to hurt these kids. Mm-hmm. Um, they are trying to interrupt dangerous behavior. Um, I just think that's important to note because, you, you uh, again, it's this thing that you see in science where, like, someone will have an idea that isn't inherently horrible, but because of how another person takes it and evolves it, it becomes something profoundly abusive. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think it's important to note this doesn't start as an abusive behavior. It starts as, as a, a desperate attempt to stop people from hurting themselves. Israel School was an early adopter of Sibis. Uh, Matt liked the consistency of the shock. He liked that applying it required less manpower than holding down a child to assault their feet. Uh, the BRI tested it on 29 students over 14 months. One early guinea pig was Brandon Sanchez, an autistic boy who was also the nephew of a state representative. From Wired, quote, 
Brandon banged his head until he cracked it open. He once chewed off part of his tongue. He was a ruminator, too. He would vomit, chew the vomit, swallow it, and vomit again. The acidity was burning his esophagus. The vomiting was causing him to lose weight. Israel thought Sibis might be the only way to save this 12-year-old's life. Brandon was down to 52 pounds. Israel and his staff started with the treatments. 50 shocks became 100, 100 became 500, 500 became 1,000, and they still shocked more. Brandon wasn't responding, so 2,000 shocks, and then 3,000, 4,000. After roughly 5,000 shocks in a day, Israel told his staff to stop. The shocks weren't strong enough, Israel thought. He asked Sibis' developers to increase the voltage. They refused, and that's when Israel made his own machine. Mm. So you see what's happened here? I, yep. That's, first off, horrific. If you're doing that 5,000 times and it doesn't work, you, you, the problem isn't it's not strong enough. The problem is it doesn't it's, work. Yeah, I was going to say, after like shocking a kid 5,000 times, mm -hmm. you'd be like, hey, maybe yeah. we're not doing it right. <laughs> and and the, the, the people who developed this, again, didn't intend it to be used this way because he is using it the way he uses all aversives as a consistent punishment for a thing that they do. So they do a behavior they're not supposed to do. You punish them with a shock. That's not what this is intended for. This was intended to disrupt someone physically from a, mm -hmm. from an action. Um, it was, it was kind of like a, a tourniquet. It was an emergency procedure, you know? Yeah. Um, and he is not using it that way. And the way he's using it doesn't work, but instead of realizing maybe you're going down the wrong road, he decides that they just need to be electrocuted more. Um, the machine that they built was called the, well, he, he, and he works with an engineer on this, right? He doesn't do it all on himself, but the machine that Israel has built mm -hmm. that he calls the graduated electronic decelerator like decelerate, you know, like the opposite of acceleration. Yeah. Um, he, th this machine, the GED, would become Matt Israel's main claim to infamy. It was three times stronger than Sibis, and its shock lasted a full two seconds instead of one fifth of a second. Now, this is a significant escalation, and it's a dangerous one. But oh, after yeah. around a year of testing the GED, Israel became convinced that it still was not strong enough. Students uh. had gotten used to the shocks. So he developed a new, even more powerful device, one that could deliver Deliver extremely painful shocks. Israel was not the first psychologist working with this community to use electric shocks. Ivar Lavas, a doctor with UCLA, had experimented with cattle prods on children in the early 1970s. He was a major advocate for electric shocks as a behavioral modification aid early on. But in uh. 1987, uh, this doctor, Lavas, published a study that showed that after 40 weeks of one-on-one -on -one therapy, autistic preschoolers could attain what he called normal functioning without any kind of aversives. In 1993, Lavas admitted that he had been wrong and he strongly rejected his early work, saying that shock therapy was at best a short-term solution that did not fix problems and was not worth the pain it caused. So Lavas... Pretty fucked up to cattle prod kids, but he eventually, he does his research. He, he, yeah. Yeah. He eventually he says, I was got wrong. through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was wrong. This is fucked up. Don't do it. Now, when Matt Israel, and I, I should also note that I don't want to make it seem too easy what he's saying here. Like the, these 40 weeks of one-on-one -on -one therapy, that's a lot of work. It, we'll, we'll talk about it, this more. Yeah. It's a commitment. It is a commitment, and it's what these kids deserve, obviously, but it's also Absolutely. not often what there's resources or what schools are willing to devote resources, what the state is willing to re devote resources to do. Mm -hmm. um, and there's furthermore the thought that because the, 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 the adults doing this work are not well paid generally. There are some, there are some specialists who are very well compensated. There are some, there's some specific facilities that train and hire professionals and pay them well. That is not the norm. I got about mm -hmm. $8 an hour. And again, no training. Um, Jeez. You are not going to get someone to perform the kind of one-on-one -on -one therapy that Lavas is showing can work on these kids and can, can stop these kind of behaviors. You are not going to get that with someone making $8 an hour. Working and eight hours a day, you know, mm -hmm. it's just not possible. And especially, uh, we brought this up in part one where they had to do a quick turnaround in like the two weeks with a lot of these exactly. kids. Exactly. And with that, eight dollars an hour, and it, yeah, no, it's just you don't have any means to do so. You do not, and it's so much of the problem here. And again, Matt Israel is the primary bastard, but mm -hmm. the fact that. On the whole, all the state usually wants to do with these, it, 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 it's a mix. They're willing to devote more resources to the kids who will be able to work a full-time job and like make a living, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of these kids, for whatever reason, aren't 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 going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to live what what I, I guess what you would say the state considers to be a normal life, which is an economically productive life. And so the goal becomes how do we warehouse these kids for the least amount of money, as yeah. opposed to is there anything we can do to to give them a richer life to to help them like be healthier? Um, and it's um. It's something we've seen time yeah. and time again. Yeah. Just, not just here. Yeah, it's like how here. how can we take these people who aren't going to be productive, quote unquote, in our in society, an economic sense, for yeah, sure. in an yeah. economic capitalist sense, yeah, and help them out for the least amount of money. It, it's yeah, honestly depressing and infuriating. It is, and it's it's again part of the villain here is the reduction of human beings to their their pure economic potential. Yeah. So when Matt Israel started applying aversives to children with behavioral issues in the early 1970s, data on how aversives worked was severely mixed. By the early 1980s, though, clinicians and researchers had published significant studies showing positive reinforcement could work in the most difficult cases. What it required was constant quote functional analyses, which is monitoring patients all day and night to discover what is causing the behavior and then to redirect those feelings. It's basically saying that like, well, you need a level if you're going to reinforce, if you're going to change these behaviors using positive reinforcement, it's, it's a full like 24 hours a day job, monitoring mm -hmm. these kids, seeing what's causing the behaviors and redirecting them. That's obviously very expensive and difficult. Um, the best solution is the most effortful and the most expensive one. Meanwhile, electrocuting kids works in the short term to stop behavior um, that's undesirable. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of why this happens. Um, in 1991, a guy named Philip Campbell became commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Mental Retardation, which is again, that's the name of this government agency. Yeah. The, yeah. Again, the dark ages. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this, the Massachusetts Department of Mental Retardation, uh, regarded BRI as horrible, like rightfully so. They were also the organization that was supposed to regulate it. So Philip Campbell comes into, to running this department and hates hates this school that his his department is regulating with good reason. Oh, absolutely. Um, and he goes after BRI, but unfortunately, he decides to break the law to do so. And he was eventually found to have leaked false reports about the school to the press. And there's plenty of bad reports about the school, but he he does not go through this in a legal or ethical way and yeah. it causes a worse problem because BRI is able to go to the court and argue they had been wronged by Philip Campbell and the court mm -hmm. agreed. Um, and Campbell's irresponsible behavior led in 1997 to a Massachusetts Supreme Court ruling that found he and his department in co were in contempt of court. The state was ordered to pay more than a million dollars in court costs and the department was effectively dissolved. So now the Judge Rotenberg Center, and they start calling it the Judge Rotenberg Center, and honor of the judge who was most responsible for getting them through this period of, of legal fighting. Um, the Judge Rotenberg Center no longer is monitored by a state watchdog. Instead, they're only being monitored by an independent attorney hired by the probate court, which means they're effectively unregulated for a while. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. And this is the period in which the use of, he starts to experiment with electric shocks in like 1990, 91. But after 1997, it really explodes. Now that they're free to do whatever the fuck Matt Israel wants, the school expands massively. Its enrollment more than doubles from 110 kids, and this is just the, uh, the the Providence facility, to 228 in the space of about four years. The school's budget balloons from $18 million to $56 million. The patient base grows to include kids whose problems were not just like the result of a, a diagnosis, but also largely behavior-based. So kids who'd gotten in legal trouble, kids who had mm. in some cases come from jail. Some of them are like, kids with ADHD who like steal a car or something. Um, in the early aughts, the school's educational policy also changes and they switch from teaching kids and the goal being at least ostensibly, this is still a school. We're trying to alter their behavior, but we're also trying to educate them mm -hmm. to, they, they stop trying to educate them really. They, they move on to simply managing the behavior. One psychologist who worked at the Judge Rotenberg Center later told Wired, quote, Israel couldn't stand them not behaving in a perfectly controlled way. And so now that he's in total control and without oversight, Matt Israel turns the Judge Rotenberg Center into a perfect prison, one in which every single kind of behavior can be tracked, judged, and punished at the push of a button. But you know what's also a perfect prison? Oh, dear God. <laughs> Capitalism, the baby. Capitalism. Capitalism. Yeah, oh, you gotta love it. It's a perfect <laughs> prison. So lock yourself in with these products and services.
All right. We are, uh, we're back and we're, we're talking about horrible things. So I, I just told you that he, he is able to, after 97, turn the Judge Rotenberg Center into a perfect prison. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I'm going to read a quote from R- Wired that I think makes the point of what a fucking nightmare this place is. Uh, here we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, strap in. <clears throat> JRC has always believed in punishing not only the negative behavior, but also the actions that presage it. A face slapper could be shocked for simply raising his hand. This is called treating the antecedent. A lot of things can be antecedents at JRC. Yelling, refusing a teacher's order, talking out of turn. Another psychologist who left in 2002 says those aren't precursors to violence so much as ordinary classroom disturbances. JRC has video monitors in every room of the school, in every residence, has had them since 1975. Certain staffers, called quality control, sit in a control room day at night, a wall of television monitors and computer screens before them, watching everyone, and because the rooms are miked, hearing everything. The control room is ostensibly to ensure that students are shocked for the inappropriate behaviors that an employee might miss. When that happens, quality control phones the staffer in the room, who then applies the shock. But the people who sit in the control room serve another purpose. They're watching their own. If, say, a teacher in a classroom refuses to shock a kid, he or she is written up. The write-ups carry the Orwellian title, Performance Improvement Opportunities. Anyone can tattle on anyone else, regardless of the station. The school has staffers whose job is to read and track those forms. Get enough of them, and you're gone. So, yeah, that's... Wow. Fuck. That's horrifying. Yeah. Um, it also, it's making the point here with the treating the antecedent and stuff. So again, they have to go to a judge to get approved to use aversives and to shock kids like or to go to a probate court. So they have to get legal approval to do this. And mm-hmm. the way they do that is by saying the only option, they're violent, they're hurting themselves or hurting other people. And the only way to stop that is by applying the shocks, right? That's mm-hmm. how they justify this. But- and so the, the probate court is saying, OK, in order to stop this kid from hurting or even killing themselves, you are allowed to shock them. OK, mm-hmm. but the Judge Rotenberg Center, because of how they view antecedents, can define raising their hand, not sitting down when told to, refusing to take off a jacket, refusing to put on shoes, all of that. They can call antecedents to a violent behavior, and so they can electrocute kids for anything, for flapping their hands, by saying that will lead to violence if we don't electrocute them early. Yeah, they can just do fast and loose. Exactly. So they are always saying, and when they defend themselves, we only do these shocks in, in order to prevent kids from hurting themselves, but they define hurting themselves as basically fucking anything. Yeah, whatever they want it to be. Yeah. So staffers at the time, uh, and this is again the uh, uh, the early or late 1990s, noted the complete lack of fucks given to the education of kids in the center and the absolute obsession with surveillance and punishment at all times. Some teachers would eat in their cars just to avoid being listened to via hidden microphones. Meanwhile, the electrocution panopticon built by Matt Israel had a profound impact on children. One teacher told an interviewer that he'd been warned by a staffer to announce to the class whenever he reached into his pocket. One time he didn't and the kids he was with started screaming they thought he was reaching for a shock buzzer but because they'd screamed which was an antecedent to violent behavior they now had to be punished quote all of these behaviors had to be consequated with a ged electric shock there were no exceptions a scream was a scream a grab was a grab and we had to follow court approved orders so these kids are so fucking ptsd'd out by being electrocuted that they see a guy reach into his pocket and they freak out and then they have to be electrocuted for freaking out yeah so it's you see what a fucking nightmare this is yeah it's a fucking nightmare like holy shit yeah it's really bad Mm -hmm. now In interviews, Matt Israel and other representatives of the school will claim that students are only eligible to be shocked if they've engaged in seriously dangerous behavior. This is untrue, at least according to a 2006 report by the New York State Education Department. It claimed that the JRC was shocking kids, quote, without a clear history of self-injurious behaviors. It is hard to exaggerate how profoundly abusive this treatment can be. To make that point, I am going to quote from an NBC News article about a kid named Rico Torres. Quote, 
Rico was just eight the first time school staffers strapped electrodes to his legs and shocked him. They draped a 12-volt battery over his shoulders in a backpack while a nearby teacher held a clear plastic box with a photo of his face attached. When Torres misbehaved, the teacher would reach inside the box and push a button that sent a two-second jolt of electricity coursing through his body. Under his court-approved treatment plan, Torres could be shocked for threatening to hit another student or for running away, swearing or screaming, refusing to follow directions or inappropriate urination, according to court records obtained by NBC News. One employee, he said, used to shock him in his sleep. Because I didn't wake up, she shocked me, recalled Torres, now 24. Then I ended up peeing the bed, so she shocked me again. The electrodes stayed on his skin 24 hours a day, for most of a decade, until he was 18. She, oh. Yeah. Yeah, woof. Like, the fact that they would do it while he was sleeping, and it's like, and with the urination thing, it's most likely yeah. being caused because of the shocks. Yeah, yeah. If you electrocute a child while they're sleeping, they might pee the bed. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not a behavioral issue. That's a you were electrocuting a child issue. Yeah, like, oh my God. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's rough. It's real rough. Yeah, so, no. Um, yeah. My one thing is like, uh, I would just hate the, if they did this with like the more non-communicative kids, you know, yeah. the ones it's like, then, uh, it's just rough all around. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is rough all around. And it's like, I think, uh, I think a lot of these kids are nonverbal. I don't know. It's, it's a, it's, it's a mix. It's hard to get like the yeah. exact data on that, but yeah, mm-hmm. I mean that, that is an additional level of, if the kid can't even tell you well like it's the same thing with that that girl who died yeah um yeah they uh, can't tell up. you and it's like mm-hmm. oh you're misbehaving here you go yeah they're just trapped in this world of adults electrocuting them never understanding really why mm-hmm. um it's pretty bleak yeah so obviously also pretty bleak for the staff a lot of whom get this job they see it's this nice facility they mm-hmm. see it's i'm helping kids they go and they realize like oh no i'm torturing children you know there's mm-hmm. huge turnover and they don't you know it, you have to understand too a lot of these people who come to realize what they're doing is wrong initially maybe like well this guy's a doctor this school has a great reputation it's like it's got a, 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 a approval from the state and whatnot maybe I'm just being squeamish and I don't understand why this is necessary. Right, and a lot of them right. do come to realize like, oh no, this is horribly fucked up. And the school has caught, con- like most workers don't last a fucking year, I don't think. Um, which of course makes it hard to get decent staff because the kind of people who are going to do that job are maybe sometimes going to be monsters themselves. Yeah. They're like, well, it doesn't pay well, but I get to hurt people, you know? Mm-hmm. Prison guard shit. Oh um, Yeah. Yeah. The consequences of this situation where you have constant turnover, the good people leave, the folks who are able to stay for a while are maybe terrible. The consequences of this are made abundantly clear on August 26th, 2007, when a prank caller calls the staff in the middle of the night and poses as a supervisor. Remember, there's always people watching and they'll call rooms and be like, hey, such and such kid did this behavior and you didn't catch it. You need to shock him now, you know? Mm -hmm. So this person calls a supervisor who's awake on the night shift and he orders punishments for two teenagers who are asleep at the time. The kids are 16 and 19 and the person on the phone claims they had misbehaved earlier in the evening. Now, staff weren't supposed to administer shocks long after bad behavior and this had been hours ago. But also the thing that Israel had established is that if you are a staff member and you're told to shock a kid and you don't do it, you'll get fired. Right. If you don't instantly obey orders, because, again, he's kind of operant conditioning his employees too. Yeah. If you delay it all once told to electrocute these kids, you'll lose your job. Um, so the, they, they wake these kids up to shock them. Other students who were awake at the time beg the staffers not to do this. And one of them is even like, hey, this this might be a hoax. This phone call might not even be like an actual supervisor yeah. but the staff wakes both boys up and electrocutes them repeatedly because again the person on the phone says keep shocking them keep shocking them keep shocking oh, them geez. they shock them so many times that they have to bind their legs and arms so they can continue to electrocute them one teen was shocked 77 times the other 29 times the former had to be treated for two first degree burns oh, the caller is 
God. It's horrible. <laughs> horrible. Now, the caller is believed to have been a former resident of the center because he knew the staff, he knew the number, he knew the other residents. Um, so it may have been someone who was there and had an issue with these two kids and like wanted to fuck with them. I don't know. As far as I can tell, the person who did this has not been caught. NBC wrote, quote, at the time of the call, five of the six staffers had worked double or triple shifts, and most had been on the job less than three months. The staffers were des described as concerned and reluctant about the orders, but they failed to verify them with the central office or check treatment plans to make sure the teens could receive that level of shock therapy, the report said. Staffers also did not know who was the shift supervisor that night. One reason staffers might not have been suspicious of the phone call is that the Rotenberg Center uses surveillance cameras in its group homes to monitor residents and staff, and a central office employee employee is allowed to initiate discipline by phone. So again, these guys haven't been there long. They don't know who's supposed to be giving the order. So they don't recognize that anything's really fucked up. You know, they should have, obviously. Yeah, they should have at least double checked like yeah. once mm -hmm. or at all. Sometime between the first and 77th <laughs> time they shot yeah. the child they had tied to a fucking chair. Um, but it's also the fault of the system he's developed. I, not to take blame off of these people for doing something horrible, but like oh, absolutely. Matt Israel built a system where this was inevitable. Mm -hmm. The staff responsible were fired immediately, but the incident was so horrific that it sparked another set of investigations into the Judge Rotenberg Center. A court demanded video footage of the two students being shocked for three solid hours. Matt Israel ordered the footage destroyed, which was a crime, and led to him being oh, yeah. indicted by a grand jury in 2011. In order to avoid criminal charges, Israel agreed to leave the school he'd founded. So, 2011, he quits because he illegally destroys evidence and the court is like hey we won't yeah. charge you criminally if you if you get out of here Fun. which is i don't know i think maybe lock the fucker up uh yeah he should be in jail but uh, he shouldn't be around kids no <laughs> uh i'll say that so the very next year 2012 is when the general public finally got their first good look at what the judge rotenberg center had been doing to children all those years this was thanks to the case and the mother of Andre McCollins. Andre's mother had enrolled him in the Judge Rotenberg Center, not because he was super violent, but because he was special needs and he had been raped in a public school by another student. Oh. And she, her, a big selling point of the JRC, first of all, it looks very nice. It looks like a, a, a well-run mm. facility. She mm -hmm. also likes that it's heavily surveilled. It's covered in cameras. So she feels like nothing bad can happen to her kid here because someone's mm -hmm. always watching. And that's like, you have to understand, like that's all, it's reasonable that like the the fact that this place is so surveilled that, would be yeah. comforting to her because what happened to her kid, you know? She doesn't oh, want yeah, to that's get reasonable. molested again. Yeah, totally reasonable. In short order, Andre was taken off his medication because, again, the Judge Rotenberg Center and Matt Israel don't believe in medicating kids. He was put back on it after he started acting out and engaging in self-injurious behavior and, like, the school couldn't correct it. Uh, and they didn't have approval to give him electric shock. So after they have to put him back on his medicine, they go to court to get him approved to receive electric shocks. The court approves it, uh, and the treatment plan listed that shocks could be applied if he was aggressive, if he screamed, or if he tried to remove his electric, uh, uh, remove like the electrocution thing, or mm -hmm. if he engaged in what they called health dangerous behavior. And they defined health dangerous behavior specifically in his case as tensing up his body. So if he gets tense, they can electrocute better him. Treat him. <laughs> Famously relaxing electrocution. Yeah. Um, Man, they, they were horrifically creative with these excuses to shock kids. They, they were. And it's one of the fucked up things is that like they're talking about how bad he's on Risperdal. And they're talking about how bad Risperdal is. So they want to they, they take him off it. But then it, it, he he gets worse when he's off it because it, the yeah, medication's it's helping it's him. Helping. And, but, but, and that's why they justify putting this kid on the electrocution treatment so that they can take him off Risperdal again and then electrocute his behaviors away, which is, uh, yeah, the, they're basically doing the thing like, Hey, have them steal something. Now we can shock them. Yeah. And it's one of those things, obviously over medication is a problem. I known a bunch of kids who were like, and a yeah. bunch of adults who were like, no, once I found the right medication, it was life changing. Um, mm -hmm. And like the kind of blanket rejection of any sort of medication in favor of electrocution is pretty bad. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it comes out of a period when massive, like, like unreasonable and un, like immoral levels of, of medication and drugging were common. And I get that. But it, it persists past the area where there are medications that really help. And, mm -hmm. and it rejects those in favor of torture, which is is bad. Oh. So now that he's being electrocuted regularly, Andre is taken off of his meds again. 
and his mother visits him, you know, several times and sees that like he's in, he's he's changed his behavior has changed in a negative way as a result of being off his meds and probably as a result of being tortured. And mm-hmm. she begs the school to put him back on his meds. Um, the school doesn't do this uh, and the electrocutions continue. And he has like a bad incident one day where he the, the school alleges that he at least attempted to hit a teacher. So they shocked him. And then afterwards, hours after that violent incident, they shocked him again. And I'm going to read a quote from New York magazine that, that describes what happens later in that day. Okay. Like other students in the room, Andre sat at a desk facing a computer, his back to the teacher. A worker told him, Take off your jacket. Andre didn't move. Take off your jacket, please. Again, no response. An employee pressed the button to activate his shock device. He screamed. Andre fell to the ground and tried to crawl under his desk. Four adults grabbed him and wrestled him to the floor, holding him down while he struggled. His psychologist brought in a restraint board, and the employees moved him onto it, face down. Eight of them surrounded him as they bound his wrists and ankles to the board. Usually after Andre got a shock and was restrained, he'd calm down, but on this day he only got more agitated. The more upset he became, the more he tensed up his body, and the more he tensed up, the more shocks he received. Between 10 a.m. and about 11 a.m., the workers shocked him 14 times. Each press of the button triggered a loud, high-pitched alarm, informing employees the shock had been delivered, while Andre's cries echoed down the corridor. (sighs) Yeah. I... I... I don't know what else to say at this point. Like, God damn it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And yeah. after a lengthy court battle, um, his mother succeeds in making this video public. And this leads to widespread outrage against the Judge Rotenberg Center and more investigations. In 2013, a United Nations special rapporteur on torture found that students who were electrocuted at the Rotenberg School had their rights violated under the UN Convention on Torture. So the United Nations says these kids are being tortured. Like (laughs) this is, yeah, that meets our definition. (laughs) You achieved a special level of fucked. Yeah. If the UN is coming after your school, like (laughs) you might want to reevaluate. You you may be real fucked up. Yeah. Um, You know, what isn't, uh, hasn't been declared torture by the United Nations. Hopefully the products and services that sponsor this podcast. Well, most of them. Most of them. Okay. Again, north of 80%. North of 80. Ah, good odds. Good odds. Yeah. 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 The, 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 <laughs> the, the, the hard, like the strong odds are whatever advertisers are on our show have not been declared to be torturing Zing. people. Cool. Almost that's none a, of them. That's a good thing. Yeah. Ah, oh, we're back. So, as this, so, you know, this, this, the UN starts looking into shit. And as a result of this video coming out, um, the Justice Department launches an investigation that I think is still ongoing like a decade later. I haven't found a result from it. And I've read some recent reporting on it. So it, it seems like either it got kind of buried or they're getting real deep into it. But it's been a long time um, without kind of a result. Another thing that's ongoing is Matt Israel's obsession with experimenting on children. If you'll recall, decades ago, he was forced to sever his relationship with the school he'd founded in California. It had been taken over by Judith Weber, who'd been the executive director of the West Coast BRI when it was founded. Judith and Matt eventually married, and in 2015, it was found that Matt Israel, while not on staff at the West Coast BRI, which had been renamed Tobin World 2 and Tobin World 3, was working as a behavior analyst and an administrator at both facilities. The schools had not notified the state that Matt Israel had been added to the roster of employees because Matt Israel was legally prohibited from entering the facilities. From a write-up at edsource.org, quote, In unannounced visits to Tobin World 2 and 3 on January 16th and 17th, investigators also found that the schools were employing behavioral analysts with expired certifications and teachers without the required credentials to teach students with certain disabilities. The school also failed to comply with state regulations that require behavior plan reviews after staff members have physically restrained students or isolated them in rooms they cannot leave. The Judge Rotenberg's uh, Educational Center is the only facility in the country that still uses is electric shock therapy in this way. Roughly 20% of their students receive shocks, although, given what we know about how lax these facilities can be about rules and paperwork, it's hard to say if that's really all the kids who receive shocks. 
In March of 2020, the FDA banned the use of electronic shock devices in the context that they're used in the center, saying they caused, quote, an unreasonable and substantial risk of illness or injury. But in July of this year, in a two-to-one decision by the Washington, D.C. District Court of Appeals, it was ruled that the FDA's ban violated federal law by interfering with the authority of healthcare practitioners to practice medicine. The center's attorney, Mike Flamia, told CNN that the ruling was important because, quote, It protects what all of us cherish, and that is the right to go to our doctor and have our doctor decide what is the best treatment. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You do you, I guess. What the heck? Well, you do your kids. Yeah, it's messed up. Yeah, like, honestly, that's unbelievable because it's like, yeah, I know it could be a little bit. So it's like, hey, my doctor can tell my kid that yeah, you need to be shot. And a lot of them didn't even have the credentials anyways. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, again, that's part of it is like, well, I, my doctor, I have a right to, you know, pick my doctor okay. and for him to pick his, well, but a lot of these people aren't legally qualified to, to prescribe any kind of treatment to your kids. Or like, to not deal doing with kids with yeah. autism or anything. Yeah. Of that sort. yeah that's the thing that's pissing me off the most about this. It's like, yeah. These people are making super important decisions that they, they have no right to make. Yeah. And part of this issue is this thing I've, I've complained about a few times on the show, which is that like they're framing this as like, well, we want the freedom to go to our doctor and, and, and have our doctor decide. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. You want the freedom to have absolute power to say what is and isn't okay for your kid. And um, I don't think parents should have that. You're not the God of your child and you're not the government of your child. And I don't think government should have a lot of the power that they have. But like I there's there's this problem of how parents are treated as the ultimate authority of what's good or bad for their kid, Mm -hmm. which uh, has a a lot of horrible consequences outside of this, too. But this is one of those consequences where it's It's, like, well, yeah, especially within the context here where a kid is autistic and may even not. It's like, well, the parents basically get the keys to the kingdom. They get to make the final call. Mm-hmm. And it's, they don't know what's going on most of the time. Yeah. yeah. A lot of parents suck. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe don't make them the absolute God yeah. of their, of their child. Cause that's a bad thing. I will but, say no full disclosure. Mine don't, but I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad, I, yeah I, but, but you know i know i know i've known yeah. some people who had disabilities parents that weren't that great yeah exactly and it's it's a problem yeah um so the jrc was supported by a significant number of parents uh, who has always argued that the facility was a matter of last resort for their kids in making this case flamia the lawyer offered up the argument that absolutely no other treatment had worked for these kids quote I know that the people that oppose this treatment, they'll tell you over and over again that there are other treatments that work as well, if not better. And they'll talk about positive behavior supports, which JRC does all of that. They'll talk about drugs, psychotropic medications. These clients at JRC, they've tried all that. Numerous drugs, numerous diagnoses, numerous combinations of drugs. That is, again, extremely common, this line of argument. They've tried Mm -hmm. everything. This is the last resort. I think the most dedicated example of this came from that Wired article I've cited a bit in this episode. And while that article goes into horrible detail about abuses at the JRC, it also Mm -hmm. includes this bit. You don't know what it's like to be the parent of a student at the Judge Rotenberg Center. You don't know what it takes to hear all this and still come out in favor of the school. And you don't know because you don't have a kid who pulls out her hair in bloody clumps, who seems to enjoy that, okay? A kid whose scalp resembles that of a frontier settler worked over by a furious native. And then to see her today, happy, smiling, a brunette just like any other brunette, and all thanks to JRC, her life saved by the machine. Saved. And that's just one kid. Just one story. You see? There's another side. There's a lot that's fucked up about that Wired article. Um, yeah. And they cite they cite some science that makes the situation seem much more muddled as to whether or not this is best. Um, a lot of that science is at this point more than 20 years old. The most recent studies I think they cite are, are, are from 1999. Oh, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's made more difficult by the fact that the JRC isn't exactly required to hand over objective, reliable evidence about the efficacy of its methods. Yep. And there's strong arguments that they're not fixing any problems these kids have. They're just temporarily suppressing them with violence. Yeah. And there's um, also the thing of like, are they actually trying these other methods or are they just yeah. going straight to the shocks? Or are they just going straight to the shocks? Um, the And yeah, supporters of the school will argue that like, 
the schools that's that don't use aversives and that use only positive support will turn kids down. We'll say this kid is too severe for us. And eventually those kids have no other option but the Judge Rodenberg Center, which turns nobody down. Um, now, most of the studies I've come across that purport to show a benefit to the aversives used at the JRC are more than 20 years old and, again, are very not at all conclusive. Um, the preponderance of evidence seems to suggest that these kind of treatments are not necessary even in the most severe cases. But the kind of treatments that help in the most severe cases are labor intensive and expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it is worth noting, regardless of what you want to get into the weeds on the science here, no other facility in the U.S. uses these methods. And many other facilities do treat children with problems just as severe using methods that do not involve electrocuting kids. Mm -hmm. The Judge Rotenberg Center and the parents who support it argue that as unpleasant as the shock treatments are, they also represent the only viable treatment for patients who would otherwise destroy themselves. Nancy Weiss is the director of the National Leadership Consortium on Developmental Disabilities at the University of Delaware. She has been a longstanding critic of the JRC, and when that court ruled they could keep electrocuting kids, CNN went to her for comment on this matter. She said, quote, Part of the reason that people with disabilities have behavioral problems, behaviors that we find challenging, is that they're protesting the crappy lives we offer them. It's that person's only form of protest, and it's a critique of the life they're being offered. It's like there's no greater human impulse than to be in charge of your own life. And what JRC does, to an extent beyond what any other provider in this country does, is strip people of choice and control. Yeah. I mean, when you get down to it, it's ultimately, there are much better ways of doing it than yeah. electric shock. There are, there are, and I, I find it compelling what she says about... The, a lot of these bad behaviors of these kids protesting in the first place that their lives, even before the JRC, didn't yeah. offer them a lot of, of autonomy of choice. But also um, what what Israel is, did at his facility is, is strip choice because he doesn't see people as having choice. He doesn't no. really believe in free will. He believes that we're just the product of, of, of stimuli that's put into us. Um, yeah. He treats these kids like robots. He treats his staff like robots and the belief that you can make this perfect system if you just put perfectly consistently put the right stimuli in. And it does kind of work as long as the kids are getting electrocuted for the most part. They stop mm -hmm. the behavior. They, they comply. Um, but that isn't because anything has changed about them. It's because they've been tortured into not doing certain things. Mm -hmm. He just didn't have an issue with that because again, everyone's a robot. Yeah. yeah. It's just a feature. Yeah. It's a feature. Um, it's pretty bleak. <sighs> eh? Yeah. It is yeah. pretty bleak. <laughs> oh God. So yeah, the FDA has, you know, the FDA to its credit eventually did try to stop this. Mm -hmm. Um, but then a the judge was like, no, 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 oh. we're going to keep doing this shit. So, so are they still running today? Oh, yeah. Yep. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at the end, yeah, I. That's freaking bleak, man. <laughs> yeah. I wish yeah. I could have more to say, but I'm just because. The, the biggest problem, because as somebody who is autistic, is there are some people who, like myself, are lucky enough to be able to do work and all that fun stuff. And, so, and a lot of times we get the name Asperger's, but fuck that shit. Yeah. And so it's like, I just, I couldn't imagine something like this and just, it just makes me feel so angry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm rambling. Like I'm no, 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 no. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> really important. Like the, um, I don't know. How do we, uh, how are we, because we all have, uh, we all have some form of mental disability, even if it isn't outwardly apparent, how are we able to be able to treat one another, support one another? without dehumanizing and freaking shocking them like cattle. Yeah. And it's, um, it, part of the problem here is that 
a significant chunk of, of people with autism um, aren't legally in control of their own lives, which in some of that, them are not in, in that is a, true. A, a legal capacity capable of, 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 of being in control, yeah. in, in, at least in a legal sense of the word. Mm-hmm. Um, they need some sort of, of caretaker. Do they need um, help, yeah. But that means they're not making decisions for themselves. And, and so like the, the industry that has developed around providing these people with care often, and in fact, largely does so without any real input from the people in it. Mm -hmm. Um, And because the people who are kind of most vulnerable to this tend to be unable to express themselves in a way that is easy for most people to understand it happens without most people being aware of it. And and so there's no outcry and nothing is done and it, and it continues on for decades and decades. Because they think that's how it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the only option or the best option or, you know, well, look, their parents say this is fine. And like, yeah, it's, um, it's not great. No, it's it's not great. Mm -hmm. Well, Aiden, you got any pluggables to plug? Uh, you can follow me on Twitch at notch the B N O T C H T H E B. Uh, I post a lot there, social commentary, do that stuff. Um, but that's my big thing to plug. Sweet. Well, plug out, plug away. And, uh, I don't know. Uh, yell at the FDA or a judge or something about this. I don't know. I guess the yeah. FDA is more or less on board. I don't know who to yell at at this point. Just, just yell. Just yell. You, you Howl gotta, to the sky. You gotta fucking stand up for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Aiden. And that's that's uh, behind the bastards. Thanks for having me.